Hello everybody, welcome back to the course on material and energy balances. So, until now we have covered all the fundamentals related to material balances when we talk about process industries. So, we looked at many chemical and biochemical processes when able to apply material balances and perform calculations based on law of conservation of mass. And this has helped us in designing processes, understanding what would be the required input, required output, desired output and so on. Uh, today we are going to have a guest lecture. So, he is a faculty in IIT Madras, this is Dr. Karthik Raman. He is actually working as a faculty in the Department of Biotechnology IIT Madras. He is going to talk about an application of material balances to biological systems. Instead of looking at uh, process level systems, he will be talking about how to apply material balances for metabolism and uh, metabolic pathways. So, he will be talking about how these principles which we have discussed till now can actually be applied for simple metabolic pathways and uh, obtain effective balances and perform calculations which are similar to the ones which we have been performing. So, for the first few lectures of this week, it will be Dr. Karthik Raman who will be teaching these aspects. So, welcome to this video. So, today I am your guest lecturer. My name is Dr. Karthik Raman. I am also from the Department of Biotechnology at IIT Madras and I work in the area of computational systems biology. I am a guest lecturer in this course on material and energy balances that uh, Dr. Vignesh has been teaching. And today my lecture you may see is titled The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Material Balances. This is actually a play on a very popular essay in the 60s which was uh, The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics in the Natural Sciences. So basically they found that math was able to answer several interesting questions in biology and the natural sciences. And similarly I will show you how you know you may think that material balances are very simple, very you know just in involve systematic thinking and so on and has applications to say chemical reactors or you know small chemical processes and so on. But today I will show you how you can apply it to a large cellular system like say a growing E. coli cell to predict its growth rate and so on. So really speaking my talk is titled constraint based analysis of cellular metabolism. So what is it that we are going to look at today? <coughs> I am going to teach you the concept of what is known as a stoichiometric matrix and how do you apply material balances to cellular systems, large cellular systems and how we systematically apply this concept known as constraint based analysis to predict the growth rate or the phenotype or the behavior essentially of a cellular system. And how do you for example apply it when you remove a gene from a cell and so on. So what is metabolism or <coughs> what kind of systems are we talking about here? You must be familiar with these kinds of uh, systems wherein you have a simple reaction A plus B going to 2C, B plus 2C going to D, B plus 3D going to E and so on. What is important to note is that there is a stoichiometry in each of these cases and we have only 3 reactions here. This is a more real system which is like glycolysis. So, it starts from D glucose plus ATP giving ADP plus glucose 6 phosphate and you have about 10 reactions finally culminating in the production of 2 moles of ATP and 2 moles of pyruvate from 1 mole of glucose right. So, this is very important. So, we will see why this becomes an important uh, aspect when you model uh, the cellular systems and so on. And this is a simplified view, I like to say it is simplified because uh, of various reasons. So, it is a simplified view of what happens within a living cell right. So, what you have here is you have thousands of small molecules or metabolites all undergoing different fates you know there are, there are thousands of reactions happening in the, in the cell causing conversions between several of these molecules to other molecules and so on and this changes with time, with the time of the day, with what you have eaten and so on. So, there is a very complex uh, network that operates inside every living cell depending upon the availability of various nutrients and various metabolites and I call this simplified because each of these molecules actually represent say Avogadro number of molecules like nanomolar concentrations. So, you are talking about say 10 to the 15 molecules or so. So, there are 10 to the 15 molecules of each type right that you see here interacting in hundreds of thousands of or thousands of different ways within a any living cell. But if you were to model it I would just write it down as a long linear set of reactions. 
So, this is an alphabetical list which goes from activated tRNA plus L cysteine giving something all the way up to gamma glutamyl putrescine and somewhere along the middle you may be able to recognize that you have this tricarboxylic acid cycle reaction. Right. So, this is what a modeler essentially works with. You have a long system of reactions and you want to because we are discussing in this course you want to write a mass balance for it or a material balance for it and then see uh, how we can model it. So, let us just step back and take a very simple system that you see on the screen here and can you write down the equations governing the rate of change of each of these metabolites. So, what is d a by d t? what is d b by d t and so on. You may be able to say that d a by d t will be b 1 minus v 1, d b by d t would be v 1 which brings in b minus b 2 which takes out b and you know you may have to commit to a particular angle here. So, this is shown with both arrows because it is a reversible reaction, but essentially you have to you can say that it is goes in this direction and if the value v 2 is greater than 0 then it goes in this direction, if it is less than 0 it is b going to c. So, let us assume for a moment that it goes in this direction. So, in that case it would be v 1 minus b 2 plus v 2 and so on. Right. So, if you were to write out all these reactions you can potentially show them in a matrix form. So, this is going to be a phi cross 1 or number of metabolites cross 1, this is going to be 7 cross 1 or number of fluxes or number of reactions cross 1 and this is therefore going to be m cross r. So, you can actually think of writing these as corresponding to reaction v 1 or maybe I could say reaction 1, reaction 2 reaction 3, reaction 7 where the first two are the real reactions that you see here and the remaining 5 are what are known as exchange reactions. So, this is a nice matrix we will look at it in greater detail in in a uh, maybe in a few slides, but this is basically all you have to how you have to fill up this matrix is you can write out the equations and carefully fill it up, but more easier is you just whatever is <coughs> on the left hand side whatever is a reactant you give it a negative coefficient, whatever is on the product side you give it a positive coefficient right. So, so you can think of this as a, so if A is on the left hand side whereas B is on the right hand side right and again D is also on the left hand side and E is on the right hand side. So, this is basically an A plus D going to E plus B. So, so, this is the first column of the stoichiometric matrix and if you see d a by d t will be minus 1 into v 1 plus 1 into b 1 right. So, rest of them will all be zeros. you will have um, 4 zeros. right. So, d b by d t will be v 1 minus v 2 plus v 2, but if you see b is on the so this is second reaction b is on the left hand side right because we said that the reaction is c going to b right and so on. So, so and c will have a minus 1 right because that is because d c by d t will be minus v 2 and so on because v 2 takes away minus v 2 plus b 3 and so on right. So, you can fill this up. So, the final matrix will look like this you may see there is like a, a minor variation here 
or not? Yes, because I have assumed this as B going to C as the direction not uh, this way. But essentially you can basically just fill this out directly from the set of reactions that you have. So, once you have the stoichiometric matrix you can do a lot of things. So, let us, but let us now take a step back and look at what are all the strategies to model large cellular systems. You can write out differential equations and model them that is known as kinetic modeling and I will tell you shortly why that is difficult or then you can do something known as constraint based modeling which is what I will focus on for most of today's lecture. So, this is to give you another analogy of what a metabolic network really is. So, you can think of it is essentially a set of long, long set of reactions as far as a model is concerned, but to give you a picture you can think of isolated reactions like being roads if you were to have an analogy with uh, traffic networks and a metabolic map is similar to a road map, but the most interesting part comes when you look at the flux distributions or the metabolite dis or the traffic distributions. You know how much traffic is being carried in each road, so you know what are all the important roads, what are the blocked up roads and so on and you can make similar analyses when you are looking at metabolic networks. So, what is kinetic modeling? You basically write d a by d t is some you know v max into s by k m plus s if you know my Cayley's mentor and so on or mass action as the case may be and so on and the important thing is it can obviously give you insights into dynamics. So, how does a change with time, how does b change with time and so on, but it requires the knowledge of parameters. You need to know all the k's in your system like k 1, k 2, k 3 and so on and this becomes a nightmare if you want to estimate them from data. I will not get into the details in this course, but this is basically very tricky especially when you have a large number of parameters to fit, right. You may have uh, fit simple equations where you did a simple Michaelis Menten or so on experiment and just to find out uh, two parameters like the Km and Vmax corresponding to the enzyme, but it becomes much much harder when you are trying to solve like say a system of 2000 reactions, right. So, you can think if there are two parameters for each reaction you are looking at estimating 4000 parameters from data which is very very difficult by difficult it is impossible. So, it is useful for smaller systems, but rarely applicable to larger networks of the sort that we want to work with right. So, you want to take E coli which has say 2000 reactions and make predictions this is not going to work. So, what do we do we go in for something known as constraint based modeling.